Okay, this is chapter two, part three. We're gonna start um, a little where we left off. We're gonna go over a little bit um, what we have already went over, but I'm gonna go ahead and make it fresh start at CBA or stroke on this page 42. Okay. Cerebral vascular accident. When asked the question, what is a CBA? I don't want stroke, but I want y'all to know it means stroke, but I want cerebral vascular accident. What does CVA stand for? Cerebral vascular accident. It occurs when blood supply to a part of the brain is blocked or blood vessel leaks or ruptures within the brain. Um, always equate it to plumbing, plumbing burst in your head. Um, whereas opposite your heart attack is your heart. That's the only two differences. Stroke happens in your brain, heart happens in your heart. Uh, a transi transient ischemic attack is kind of like it went through. Uh, maybe a clot went through or something happened where they kind of go out and then they, they regain consciousness. Uh, sometimes they lose some of their abilities. Sometimes the first thing, they um, have a little slurred speech sometime or, or something's a little weak. But a lot of times it is um, it comes back, whereas maybe the stroke, maybe not. Um, but that is also a precursor to a real stroke. So if that happens to you, then you need to start putting you on some thinner, blood thinners, so you are less prone to clot. Because something happened, it's like a clot went through your brain, it didn't stop, which is a wonderful thing, but um, it causes that TIAs. Um, signs that a CBA is occurring, facial numbness, weakness, or drooping, especially on one side. Because your brain it operates, your, your left side operates your right. So if you got an injury on this side, it's going to affect your right side. Um, same here. But if it's in like in the back motors, it could affect both sides. But a lot of times your stroke really affects one side really bad. Um, and most of the time it's that one-sided weakness that you're going to notice that one face drooping. They start slurring or slobbering out the side of their mouth or it's something. Um, and that's, that's the stroke. Uh, arm or leg numbness, especially on one side, slurred speech, inability to speak, use of inappropriate words. One young man, he wasn't young, probably 50, 57, and um, he was having a stroke. We did not know it, you wouldn't have known it, but only thing he kept saying, like, I wanna go, um, I wanna go couch. Something crazy like that, and he's like, I don't wanna say that. And he literally said that to me, I don't wanna say that. And he said something else and he just used weird words. He said, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it, it wouldn't come to him. And we sent him to the hospital because that was just strange and odd. And that's one of the odd things that uh, a stroke, maybe it was affected, whatever that part of the brain was, maybe it was affected then. And um, that's how it was. He was using inappropriate words just in a, in a, in a weird spot. Um, in a, inability to understand spoken or written words. Maybe he's saying, you know, I don't understand you. What are you saying? And you're just this plain spoken and everything. Yeah, I can hear you, but what? You, you're like speaking jumbo. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a sign of a stroke too, that they can't, something's happening between the messages from you to their brain. They're not getting it. Um, redness in the face, noise of breathing, dizziness, blurred vision, trouble walking, loss of balance. A lot of them will fall because it's one, one side, they'll feel the fall. Ringing in the ear, severe headache, nausea, vomiting, I've seen that, they vomit before. It's either when it's unexpected, weird, and hard, and they're not really nauseous, and they just kind of, you know, it's something in the brain triggers that, and I don't know what it is, but um, it's hard to take a stroke a lot of times, and that's just a weird sign. Um, paralysis, of course, on one side of the body, Elevated blood pressure, slow pulse rate, loss of consciousness. In addition, women have little different symptoms sometimes. Pain in the face, arms, and legs. Hiccups, weakness, chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitation. Um, any of that kind of stuff. Let's just go to the doctor if it's odd and strange. And we're so good at, you know, I'll, I'll even feel my heart feel like it's fluttered. And I'll be like, should I go to the doctor? No. But one day it's gonna do something and I'm gonna be in trouble if I just say, up oh, it's fine. But um, women, a lady had, um, her back was hurting her back. She was like, oh my back, oh my back. 
That was actually a heart attack, though. But same kind of thing. You know, that has nothing to do with your heart, but her back was killing her, and it kept it. And it got real bad. She wanted to go to the ER for her back. Got there, and she was having a heart attack. Back wasn't really injured or really hurting, but the pain receptors are weird with the inside parts of your body. I had the spleen messed up, and I had the heart attack symptoms, the, the shortness of breath, like somebody punctured my lungs. Like somebody literally put a hole in my lungs. And I, I told him, I said, maybe my lungs are punctured. Because it was after a fight. It hit me in my spleen. And um, they thought I was having a heart attack, too. But it, it wasn't none of that. Um, I mean, it went down my arm. I mean, like, I was hurting. And um, it was my spleen. But all your little parts in your body doesn't have the right pain receptors. They, it hurts in another place. So that's why, watch out for weird hurting. And you know, you ain't hurt nothing. I ain't hurt my own. I know, you know. But that was just my spleen. So just know, maybe a different. Vomiting, it is called the other name. We say emesis. We can say vomiting. That's not a bad word. Emesis um, is the one we're probably going to chart. We'll say emesis. Um, it's the act of ejecting stomach contents through the mouth and or nose. So underline that. That's your famous, you know, scientific wordage. It just means vomiting throwing up that's all that means we can't do a lot for a patient who's vomiting but take care of them clean them up afterwards um me if it's right before as a nurse i can give you some nausea medicine um uh, as a cna you know offer them maybe ginger ale saltine crackers things like that um and maybe sometimes that settles the stomach uh, i offer them a trash can as well you know uh careful <laughs> go sit down and use this fresh can don't come up here at me i've actually been thrown up on but that's vomiting um make sure we put our gloves on that is bodily fluids um in this thing and a lot of times we'll have to measure it and note was it ground up was it watery what color was it was it barely digested uh that tells a lot to our doctor um what's going on with it Describe the de and demonstrate infection prevention practices. So inf infection pre prevention is exactly what it is, preventing infections. First, we have to have a microorganism. It's a living thing or organism that's so small that it can only be seen by a microscope. So that's why micro, meaning so small, microscope. Uh, microbe is another name for microorganism. Underline what infections are. They occur when harmful microorganisms called pathogens invade the body and multiply. So what is a pathogen? It's a harmful microorganism. We have microorganisms everywhere. A harmful one is what's gonna cause a disease. It's called a pathogen. Um, then they drop to localized infection. You got an infection, but it's localized. Say you got a cut on your arm and you, it's infected, red, swollen. That is localized. Say. You let it go, you didn't take antibiotics, whatever happened, it got into your blood. That is systemic. Anything body, the whole body is systemic. And a lot of infections happen like that. People die like that. They haven't taken care of whatever it was. Uh, UTIs in older people, they will die from a UTI. You could die from a UTI. Um, if it doesn't get taken care of or they give you the wrong antibiotic, you know, that, that's, that's some serious stuff. So we always, um, that's kind of when, when people start acting confused and weird, um, especially our older people, it goes to them like this. And we're gonna, we're checking their urine, to make sure they don't have a UTI, because it can quickly lead to a systemic infection, systemic bodily infection. Um, sometimes you're in, in the hospital and you catch a disease. Underline that, we call it a healthcare associated infection. Another name for that is nosocomial. Make sure I get these uh, highlighters back. I'm just testing them out. And put them right back on this desk when you're here. Healthcare associated infection, HAI, or also know that word nosocomial. We'll learn that somewhere. I don't see it, but it's in here somewhere. Uh, chain of infection, you've got to have these six things. The agent, which is what's causing it. Then your reservoir, where it lives. The port of exit. How is it getting from me to you? Uh, a, a port of entry. How does it get into you? 
and you have to be a susceptible host. Maybe it's um, the uh, flu. And so that's what we use for now. We use the flu. So the cause of agent is the pathogenic microorganisms that cause disease. So that would be the flu virus. A reservoir, where is it going to grow? Most of the time, your flu. That's your lungs and your nose, your airways, passages. Um, microorganisms grow in best in warm, dark, and moist places. Underline that. Somewhere they're going to ask you where does bacteria like to grow. Warm, dark, moist places. Including, and that last sentence there up under reservoir, lungs, blood, large intestines. Loves to live there. Okay, port of exit. Say it's the flu. This person has the flu. It's grown. It's in their lungs. How are we going to get it out of their lungs? They're going to cough, sneeze. Um, most of the time it's, it's a sneeze or a cough, but it's airborne. It travels. It travels. Um, any openings, nose, mouth, eyes, or cut in the skin. Any kind of way that that microorganism is getting out of that person. It's grown. It's there. Now, how's it getting out? So, how are we going to transmit it? Underline motor transmission. That's probably the most important that we can prevent. How are we going to prevent motor transmission? That's how it gets to the next person. How it travels. What's the number one thing we have to do in healthcare? Wash your hands. That's the best way to prevent the spread of infection. Is by um, preventing the motor transmission. If we can't, okay, I got it. Okay, it's growing on me. Okay, it's I sneeze. But if I don't carry it to you or if I don't sneeze on you, or however, if that does not happen, maybe I have a mask on. So I did all that, but it didn't travel to you. So we're good. Or it was on my hands and I washed my hands. That is your motor transmission. Direct contact, that's all it means, is I directly touched you and you got it. Uh, blood diseases are a lot like that. If you have an open, I mean, they're actually harder than you think. For someone to catch a blood disease unless you're having sex or sharing needles. That's blood straight in your veins, things like that. Um, but don't take no chances. Anytime you're dealing with blood or bodily fluids, gloves, gloves, gloves. And after you take off your gloves, because you've been around bodily fluids, immediately wash your hands. Because it's there. And if you take them off, you might have it on your hands deep. Wash your hands. Um, indirect, it means that maybe I touch something. And then you come behind me and touch. A lot of times, germs do not like to live on surfaces, but they will. They do live on surfaces. That's why we have disinfectant spray, Lysol, all of the above. We use all of that for those reasons because it's not necessarily going to die. Um, HIV, a lot of your blood stuff will dry and die once it hits air. Some stuff it doesn't. It stays until you pick it up or kill it. Um, okay, we've done all that. And I sneezed on you. You still got to have a port of entry. How are we going to get it inside your body? You've got to breathe it in, touch it. Something has got to get to you. How's it going to get to you? They call that the port of entry. Could be cracked skin, and that would be my problem. Or these fingernails I'm always breaking. Or biting. But some kind of broken skin. But the best transmitter is that mucous membranes. And those are... Um, all lined in your cavities, any of your cavities, uh, linings of your mouth, nose, eyes, rectum, and genitals. That's why you don't want nobody spitting in your eyes. This is like an open wound portal. You know, not wound, but pathogen portal. If somebody spits in your eye, you're likely to catch an infection really easy. Um, same with your genitals, very easy. They like those spots. They can grow very well. And on top of that, Remember, we got the flu, or I had the flu. But guess what? You've had your flu shot, and it's the same strain. It's got to be the same strain. So are you going to get the flu? Even though I did all that, you got it. You breathed it in. Are you going to get the flu? Yeah. No. Not the same strain. Uh -huh. I thought it was same strain you're going to be immune to. That doesn't mean all flu, but there's several strains. But um, you have to be a susceptible host. Same as maybe it was hep B. And you got your vaccine, you're going to get happy. Same if it's polio, same if it's measles, mumps, rubella, all those shots that we get, those vaccines for. And, and flu shot, but it's, you know, it's always a certain flu they give each season that's, that's prevalent in our area. 
that does not mean you go to California and you should get the same flu shot. They might, might have a whole different flu shot uh, across another country if they give them. But, um, you know, that is, um, they give it for that strain. And hopefully that's the strain that somebody's trying to give you. <laughs> but um, that same, that's why we take vaccines. We can do all that and it can get to you, but if I've had my vaccine, I won't get it. Um, transmission or passage or transfer of most infectious diseases can be blocked by using proper infection prevention practices, such as, what's number one? Hand washing, always, always, always. We can, we can fix things with hand washing a lot. We can, um, all those hospital associated infections that you got in the hospital, a lot of times it's told it from one room to the next. Sometimes they have done studies where they'll take that bacteria, study it, and figure that bacteria is the same bacteria that was in this room, and it's in this room. You might, they can, might can even figure out the, the, the nurse that took it, or the, you know, it could have been a wound care nurse, or it could have been a CNA and did this and that. That's why they're trying to do so much dedicated equipment. Dedicated means your equipment. It means your blood pressure cuff, your everything in your room. When you're done with it, they take it, and um get it cleaned but um it's yours the whole while you're in there and if you got anything infectious they try to do that blood pressure cuffs um they trying to leave in your rooms things like that at the hospital instead of carrying that same machine from you to you to you you might can catch something um just know all of that is uh how you get an infection hand washing is part of what we call medical asepsis and you're going to know the the difference of medical asepsis as opposed to surgical asepsis. There's two different things. Medical asepsis refers to the measures used to reduce and prevent the spread of infection. Reduce is the magic word. Medical asepsis reduces. Whereas surgical or sterile technique is the state of being free of all microorganisms. So medical is reducing. And that's the spray, the Lysol spray. It's 99.9. .9. How many times y'all see it on the little bottle? 99.9. And it's good. And some of them, especially the institutional ones, I don't know where mine is, but it'll sit there and list all the things that, that it works for, which is amazing sometimes. It's got 